Environmental activist Onimo Basi joins me on the news via Zoom to discuss this. Good to have you join us. Thank you very much. So we've seen um, floods across parts of Europe. We've seen um, wildfires in Europe, in America. We've seen floods in Africa. Help us put all of this into proper context. Well, nature is speaking to humans in very clear terms. Uh, the floods we are seeing are distributed across the world. There's not one region in the world that is not affected by flooding. A flooding, as you mentioned, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in North America, in South America, there's flooding everywhere. And now we're having very serious fire uh, outbreaks. And this, are, this can all be traced to uh, expected uh, effects on global warming. The earth is getting warmer and nations are not taking steps to ensure that at least things are, things are done to reduce this trajectory. Uh, and so uh, the floods we're seeing us, is also showing that no nation actually is ready, is, is, is resilient enough to withstand the kind of freak weathers that could just overturn everything. And so this is time for real climate action by nations and politicians just have to stop playing politics with climate change. Nature is speaking loud and clear, and this is what is going on. Uh, temperatures have gone above 1.2 degrees beyond what it was in pre-industrial levels, and current climate talks are uh, aimed at keeping temperatures below 2 and around 1.5. Uh, but the kind of action that countries have put on the table that they're going to take to tackle global warming are such that global temperatures could rise up to 3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level. That would be totally catastrophic. And we saw a new research study by um, one of the groups in the UK um, that things could actually get worse even in the UK. Alone just this year, the UK has experienced the hot, the warmest, the, the, the wettest weather ever. And uh, so help us understand how the indication of this in line with how far we have gone in implementing the Paris Agreement. Well, the, the Paris Agreement, if I should start from that, actually leaves a lot of loopholes for nations not to take real climate action. This is one of the big challenges with that lovely agreement, which is endorsed by virtually every nation. Uh, it leaves the issue of emission reduction, which is a major cause of the increase in the stock of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. It leaves that to voluntary decisions by government. Before, but up to 2009, the negotiations in the climate space was based on emission reduction demanded by, by agreement through the Kyoto Protocol. But since then, we've had the Copenhagen Accord, which was voluntary action, and now we had the Paris Agreement, also voluntary action. So nations would volunteer what they're going to do. And a case like for Nigeria, for example, Nigeria says we're going to do this amount of emission reduction Without, without any preconditions, and this amount with the, based on the financial or technological uh, uh, sub subsidies that we, we have, assistance that we have. But what we need to see really is that the, most, the polluting countries have to wake up and do their fair share of climate action. Africa contributes only about 3% of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, while North America and Europe contribute up to more than 30% 30, 30 each. And so you, you can see that uh, the impact that is coming to some nations uh, are, are, not, are not acceptable because, uh, unfortunately, we're all in a global climate system. Uh, but we need to see, we should see that actions must be, more action needs to be taken. And real action, the real action mm -hmm. is to change before we get the to, energy um, mode. Just sorry to interrupt you quickly. Before we get to the actions that can be taken, um, it's interesting you brought this home, especially in Nigeria. Um, I don't know if you, are, if you are aware of the recent CNN report um, that said that Lagos could be one of the um, un most unlivable places uh, before the end of the century if nothing is done about climate change. How much, I mean, help us understand how much of an existential threat to life this really is for um, Nigeria. Well, uh, I'm happy that the CNN, CNN brought that report into the public space. But we, we are all aware that, that the coastal region of Nigeria is very low-lying. And we are very susceptible to, to uh, coastal erosion and sea level rise. Already communities that are away from focus by the news, 
that the villages along the coast are losing land, are losing infrastructure, and Lagos itself, because of a number of factors, is very vulnerable. And I, I, really, uh, this is a time for very clear urban planning to ensure that the urban cities, urban centers are climate proof. In other words, we need to do all we can to be resilient. Why is Lagos going under? Why is the Niger Delta uh, so vulnerable? For the Niger Delta, the vulnerability is even more than that of Lagos because the land is naturally subsiding. It's a sinking land because it's made up of deposits that the Niger brings from Futajalon Island. And so when you have a place that is subsiding and then you have temperature increase due to, I mean, you have sea level rise due to the melting of the ice from Arctic region and so on and so forth, then you're going to have a compounded impact of sea level rise. So sea level rises, the net, the net sea level rise, not just by the melting of the ice caps, not just by, uh, by floods coming from, from various places, but um, this would, it, it would mean that a large chunk of the coast, up to, it's been... It's been All right, you, you paint a rather grim picture there, and, and a lot of people will say it is really that bad or even worse. But we took a step further in the country recently when um, we inaugurated, I think, a climate change council. That's what it is called. You were talking about actions earlier. If, if you were to give, for example, a mandate to that council, an urgent mandate, what, what would that be? What should be the first thing that should be tackled? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I just wanted to say one thing before I come to this that if we have a net sea level rise of one meter above the current levels, up to 90 to 100 kilometers from the shoreline will go underwater. So it's more, it's, more, it's, more, it's more scary when you think about that. Now, with regard to the council, the first thing to do is to, 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 to open up. Nigeria has climate change policy. Then now look at that, that beautiful, beautiful recommendations in that policy, which covers all sectors of the economy. The way we kind of energy we, we run in this country, the energy source, which is now we are moving away from hydro, we're investing more in burning fossil fuel. This is what is driving global warming. We're still burning gas. Gas flaring is continuing nonstop in the Niger Delta. This is what that council should look at. The kind of agriculture, we, if you have fossil fuel driven agriculture, which is industrial or colonial agriculture, we have to look at the option of agroecology, which actually helps to cool the planet which builds the health of the soil. And the healthy soil absorbs more carbon than soil that is loaded with, with, uh, with fertilizers and agrochemicals. So they need to look at all the sector waste management, agriculture, look at causes of pollution, look at deforestation. Our forests are not being protected right now. So the council really needs to, to sit as a cross-cutting council that can advise the, all the sectors of our economy. We, we can't allow the current rate of stealing go on in the forest sector to continue on, on, a, on a better. It's almost like uh, what we have in the oil fields, unregulated grabbing of resources. Uh, th these are the things that the council will have to look at very critically. Otherwise, uh, it will be coming too late and it will be a waste of time. Mm. And just because you mentioned gas flaring, um, let me ask you how possible it is to record any level of improvement without bringing the oil and gas corporations to the table. Uh, well, the oil and gas corporations, including predominantly the NNPC, have to be on the table. They, they are the ones burning. They don't have any reason to burn the gas. It's just a complete uh, act of illegality. Gas flaring has been illegal in Nigeria since 1984. Why is it difficult to stop gas flaring? Why are we developing new gas fields when we could utilize the gas that is being associated with crude oil, crude oil extraction? This, the, the oil companies, the, including the NMPC, the government, they have to sit down and look at the impacts. Gas flaring is not just about, it's not just about the, the gas going, causing global warming, causing flooding. It's also killing people directly. It's causing cancer, skin diseases, causing acid rain, all kinds of diseases. This, these are just against the human right, the right to life of Nigerians. And Nigeria is the seventh largest gas flarer in the world. This is a terrible record. I mean, we, we are on the, we're, we're not doing so well in statistics, but this is something that can be stopped. All right. Thank you so much for um, helping us make sense of this and, and pointing us in the right direction. Environmental activist Nimo Basi, thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much.